Okay. Hello, everybody. We've got people loading in. Got 125 people coming so far. I see 18 of you. Welcome to the AIGA Colorado Lunch and Learn with Jeremy. Hello. Piano. Did I get it right? Very close. <laughs> Can you say it? Tignano. Yeah. Tignano. I always say yeah. 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 It's not, there's no, there's not really a right or wrong way. It's a, it's a weird name. I'm sorry. You must get tired of that conversation. <laughs> oh, so, wow. We have someone from Argentina. What's, oh, you got someone from Argentina. Awesome. Yeah. While we're letting attendees sort of float in here, we were talking about, um, Raise your hand or put in the chat if you're from another country. We're curious if there are people here from outside of the US. Cool, from Argentina. I think in the Q&A channel, people could raise hands or maybe in the chat. How many students here or people here are students? If you can figure out how to raise your hand. Okay, I see that on the attendee panel. Looks like maybe a quarter of the people so far. Students, welcome students. Got a lot of people still coming. We've got maybe a third of the people online. Bay Area, yay area, hello. Singapore, London, Amsterdam. Wow. This is cool. Welcome. Shouldn't you be sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Not in London. See if there's anybody I know. Is there anybody you know, Jeremy? I saw Mike in there. And Michael Signorella, yep. director of the Boulder board. Nelson, also on the board. Hello. Rachel's here, Scott Hooten. Anyone know any good jokes while we're waiting for people to come? Oops. What do you think? Should we get started, Jeremy, or do you wanna wait a few more minutes? Um. Yeah, I think we can get started. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay. Well, welcome to the AIGA Colorado Boulder Lunch and Learn. I'm Amy Hayes and I'm your host. Um, my guest tonight today is Jeremy Timiano. He's an independent designer here in Colorado and he's also AIGA Colorado's web chair. So welcome and thank you so much for being willing to do this. He's presenting today on Design Systems 101. And then next week, he's going to follow up at the same time on Friday with a working session on how to use Figma, which is an online collaborative interface design tool. So a little bit of housekeeping before Jeremy gets started. At the, at the bottom of your browser window, you'll see there's a chat button and a Q&A button. So you can use the chat button to sort of chat amongst yourselves throughout the talk. Um, and then if you have a question for Jeremy, please post it in the Q&A channel. And he's gonna be scanning that throughout the talk and he'll try to answer questions as he goes. If you have something that may be a little more in depth, maybe save it till the end and we'll have a time, ample time at the end for questions and answers. So um, again, post your questions in the Q&A channel and feel free to chat in the chat room. And I guess uh, it's all yours, Jeremy. Cool. Well, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, as Amy said, my name is Jeremy Tignano, and I'm going to just start doing a screen share so you guys can see the presentation. Um, okay, so you should be seeing designing design systems. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so as Amy introduced me, my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm an independent designer based in Denver. Um, I've spent the last two years really focused on design systems, especially for digital product and visual identity. 
Um, in that time, I've done anything from really small one week turnaround projects to much bigger, um, like 18 months to create design systems um, for a range of clients um, from, you know, food service to brick and mortar businesses, um, tech companies, everything in between. And currently I'm uh, working with the design team at Dropbox to scale their design system. Uh, so my areas of focus and kind of what I'm going to be talking about today in part one of this two part series is developing design systems and getting buy in for them. Uh, designing and building reusable styles, components and patterns for digital products um, and cross functional collaboration for adoption and scale of existing systems. So today, um, what I wanted to, to share with you all is um, kind of a, a high level introduction to um, design systems. So first of all, you know, what even is a design system? I think for better or for worse, design systems have become a really popular topic these days, especially um, in digital products. And I think there's some kind of misconceptions out there about uh, what they really are. Um, so I wanna share some insights I have into kind of just defining that term. Um, why would we want to make a design system or why would you as a designer want to use a design system? I think this is a really important consideration. Um, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes creating a design system for your client or for your, for your company if you're working in-house can be a really great idea. Sometimes it maybe isn't the best idea. Um, and sometimes you're a designer working on a team and you come into work one day and you're told we're gonna start using a design system and you might wonder, you know, why are we doing this? What's, what's the benefit um, to me as a designer and what's the benefit to our audience or our end users? So I'm gonna cover some, some stuff there. Um, and then finally, how do you make a design system? And we're gonna get really a lot more into that in part two of this series where we'll do a more hands-on workshop with Figma. Um, but I am going to cover some stuff today on just uh, on just um, kind of the high level how you would get started and kind of what goes into it. And then we do have some time um, at the end for just getting questions answered if anything comes up. So first of all, what even is a design system? Um, this is a definition that I've got that I think kind of covers um, a, for a broad range of different types of systems. So I would say a design system is a shareable collection of modular and repeatable design decisions. Um, so I think there's three key parts to that definition, which are it has to be shareable, it has to be modular, and it has to be repeatable. So when I say shareable, really that means um, that design systems are intended to foster Dis uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration. Um, modular means that we keep the pieces that make the system up small enough and simple enough um, to provide this kind of like just the right amount of consistency. Um, I think consistency is something that we all as designers know is important and we all tend to value it. But I think it's also important to kind of balance that um, and not have you know, something that's too strict um, so if things aren't modular enough, you can end up with like a really strict, like it has to be exactly this way. Um, but breaking things up and keeping them kind of encapsulated makes it a little bit easier uh, to kind of achieve a level of consistency that you can still break from when there's like some particular context that needs a little bit of a different solution. And then finally repeatable. So if generally if something isn't repeatable, um, it doesn't belong in a design system. Um, these are really things that we use for kind of like scaling um, products and getting things, making things uh, able to like have new features and respond to needs that come up um, after we're launching them and as we're kind of iterating on them. So I wanted to just address this one really quick because someone's asking, is there a time to ever break the rules in a design system? Um, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, I think, you know, some of the work I'm doing right now, we're actually really encouraging designers to break the rules and then come back to us with those situations where they have broken the rules. Um, it's really important, I think, to remember that design systems are something that we create um, in large part to make our jobs 
more efficient and easier, but we don't want to sacrifice the quality of the product for that. So I think it is really important to sometimes deviate from the set rules and to make those, if, if it's in the interest of creating a better solution for that to then feed back into the design system. So there are a couple caveats, I think, to those um, big uh, keys to success, which are number one is shareable and repeatable doesn't necessarily mean shared and repeated. Um, a lot of times people will ask me like, if I don't have a client or a job that's willing to pay me to create a design system, should I like, how can I make one for myself if I'm the only one working on it? Um, and I think, you know, absolutely. You don't have to necessarily share a design system. Um, like I have a design system that I use just for my kind of personal brand um, for like all for my website and business cards and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, you don't have to necessarily share it with anyone. It's, it's still um, kind of a valuable way to just like document your thinking and, and make things easier. Um, and again, like repeatable doesn't necessarily mean repeated. Something interesting that happens when we kind of componentize um, things in the design system is that every piece of it ends up kind of getting a lot more intent attention than it might if it was part of like a bigger feature design. So even if something isn't necessarily going to be repeated, it can still be valuable to make it part of a system and then give it that space and that focus um, to really be like fully developed. I think it's especially true in um, digital product that we have sometimes like features or sub features that can become so complicated um, that it's hard to document them as part of a design in like a larger context and breaking it out into a module can be a really good way to like make sure that it's getting uh, the level of detail and documentation it deserves um, and to make it you know easier to collaborate on. Um, so to that point, collaboration, when we talk about in the design system, I think it's important to be clear that the collaboration between disciplines is a lot more important than collaboration between individuals. Um, so obviously collaborating with people is important, but if you have, you know, a hundred designers who are collaborating on a design system and no one's talking to the developers who are working on it, um, there's really not as much value in that as there is when you're doing the cross-disciplinary um, kind of collaboration. And I think it also speaks to that point of, it doesn't have to be shared just because it's shareable. You know, like I have a design system I use where I'm kind of collaborating with myself being the designer and then also like building a website with it. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to just be clear that the collaboration we're talking about is more about being cross-disciplinary than anything else. So examples of what can make a design system shareable would be custom websites, um, I think are a really important one. Um, being able to launch a website just for your design system is probably one of the easiest ways to make it shareable because it's such a common thing to just, you know, open up a web browser and, and go to a URL. If you can't do that, or even if you can do that, sometimes certain things make more sense to just be files in the cloud, whether that's a shared Dropbox folder or something in Google Drive or, you know, wherever, just making sure it's up there on the internet where a lot of people can um, access it. This presentation, for example, is just a Figma file. So it's, it's uh, in the cloud by default. We're actually gonna send out an email to everyone afterwards with the link to it. Um, but it's the same type of thing where if, if it's created with this tool, um, it's kind of shared or shareable by default. Code repositories is another big one. So once stuff starts to be built, so like front end components, uh, we can put them on GitHub or Bitbucket or wherever and make sure that those are available to uh, developers inside our team. Or you know, if our product involves third party developers, we might wanna make sure that they have access to that stuff too. Um, and I think another one that gets overlooked when we think about digital product a lot is sometimes shareable can be you know, physical things. So you know, like standards manual sells reprints of like the NASA brand guidelines and the MTA brand guidelines and all that stuff. Um, those are, you know, still design systems in the same sense. Um, so, you know, it can be a lot of different ways to make something shareable. Um, examples of modularity would be like stylistic decisions. So you might 
you know, document that say like, this is our color palette. Um, I'm gonna talk about color naming specifically in a little bit, because it can be kind of an interesting problem to solve. Uh, this also might be like typographic decisions, whether that's specific type styles or like a type scale or whatever. Um, these kind of things can be encapsulated into their own little pieces. Components are a pretty common one. So this would be like your, you know, you have like your button components and text inputs and that kind of stuff where every one of them can be kind of treated as like a designed piece in and of itself. Um, and then glyphs. So if you think about like a typeface as a design system, every glyph is one of those modules. So like you could just, you know, have the letter A and that kind of stands on its own as, as a, a piece of a larger system. Um, and we could also say things, you know, assets. So that could be like your logos and lockups for your brand identity. Um, could also include like an icon set. So every individual icon, again, is kind of encapsulated into its own little modular piece. And then repeatable, I think, is really an important thing. Um, a mistake I have seen in a lot of design systems is kind of focusing a lot on the modular pieces without really thinking about how are we going to make this repeatable. So I think it's important to take into account in creating a design system that uh, no one who picks it up is necessarily gonna read your mind. So things like usage guidelines and instructions can become really valuable to explain, you know, not only uh, what this piece of the system is, but when you should use it and when you shouldn't use it, um, if you shouldn't use it, what you should use instead. Do's and don'ts can be really important. So showing people examples of, you know, this component um, can be used in this way, but maybe shouldn't be used in some other way can be uh, a really important piece to cover off on as well. And I think also part of um, making sure that something is repeatable is making sure that it's relevant to multiple contexts. So if you have, you know, a piece of your digital product, your, your website or your mobile app that you're working on that really only exists in like one place for one flow or one piece of the experience. Um, I think it's important to, to take into account that, that that might not be a candidate for that needs to go into your design system um, if it's not repeatable. Again, there can be exceptions to that, but I think again, it's, it's just worth um, taking into account. So some examples of design systems. Um, I actually think about this a lot, that fonts are one of the original design systems that were ever created. So when you think about it, um, by definition, a font is shareable. It's either physically you know, metal or wood type, or it's a file that you can share with people. Um, the glyphs, again, are those modular pieces. And of course, they're repeatable because they have to be. That's kind of the point of, of us having fonts. Um, another example I want to share is this brand guidelines website I made. I used to work at a, a little um, digital product shop called Barbershop. So this was shareable because we made it as a website. It was modular because we broke it up into categories of like type and color and then our assets. So this became like a home for our logos and lockups and that kind of stuff. And again, we're just repeatable because we included usage guidelines. Um, so this probably looks pretty familiar, like a lot of companies have brand guidelines, um, whether they're in books or websites or whatever, and it was something that we could all just go to online. Unfortunately, it's barbershop is kind of closed for business, so this isn't online anymore, but just to give an idea of kind of how we broke things up, this was a really simple example, but um, even without having like code-specific counterparts, it still gave us just like the value of you know anyone who joined our team being able to find the right logo and use the right colors and and all that stuff and made it easier for us to collaborate with each other. Another example that I think is really uh, a great one in the digital product space is Polaris, which is Shopify's design system. Um, Shareable again is a website. They also have code components that you can get to. Um, on their GitHub repository, it's all open source. It's modular because they've got you know shared styles and components, and then again they have documented out repeatable component usage guidelines and patterns. Um, and this is at Polaris.Shopify.com. If you're interested in just kind of getting a feel of like what goes into a really robust 
digital product design system, I think this is a great one to look at. They actually published an article yesterday too about um, some of the challenges they're running into with scaling their design system and, and some of the solutions they're looking at for um, kind of localizing like smaller pieces of it for specific contexts, um, which is really an interesting situation to be in. Um, it's actually really similar to what I'm doing with the team at Dropbox. And I've heard that um, Shopify's design team is now doing something really similar as well. So that's, that's kind of a whole other topic that's maybe not as high level, but um, this is a really good one to look at. And they document things really well for like a single component. Um, I think this gives a better example of like what it means to, to keep things modular where there's really like a level of focus and attention to detail like per component. Um, so they do stuff where they'll like define what's a button, um, why would you use it this way, and what would you use instead if it was not the right choice. So those were just some examples of design systems. I think what we can see from all of these um, is some ideas of like, what are all of the things that go into a design system? So you don't necessarily have to have all of these things, although the first one I think is really important, which is principles. So design principles in the context of a design system are kind of your North Star of, um, you know, how do we know we made the right decision or what does a win look like? It has to be in line with our design principles. And these usually are going to come from um, something really similar to uh, like brand values or company values. Um, but these are maybe a little more tailored to um, design specifically. Um, so they need to be like a little bit less vague. Um, design principles in the context of a design system can also be a little more practical. So they might be things like we need uh, to have like large tap targets on this product. Um, you can get into really like more specific uh, kind of practical concerns as well in, in, when it comes to principles. Um, styles are something that I think is pretty common. So you could think of it in digital product. This is probably gonna be like color palette, um, type styles, that kind of thing. In something like a font, this might be more like we have like a particular attitude about um, you know, what angles we use or uh, how, how much stroke modulation there is, for example. I think, but it's, it's a, the same kind of thing where it's like the stylistic underpinning before you get into like the specific modular pieces, which would be more like the components or the modules. Um, I think another really interesting one to consider, and I think this is, it's becoming easier to kind of include this level in a design system is tooling. And I have some examples of that where you can actually, um, you, you might actually build tools specifically to be part of your design system that again, um, exist to, for the, to, to solve kind of the same problem of um, helping your team collaborate and helping get that cross-disciplinary collaboration. And I have some examples of that to show as well. Um, so this is an experiment that I did called the minimum viable design system. Um, and it has all of these pieces. So the, the principle of it is kind of to not really care that much about um, the actual design of it, but to be really just plain spoken about what a design system is. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's shareable, it's online. This URL at the top is actually real and you can go to it. Um, and I actually do use this as a tool for, um, or I plan to use this as a tool for creating design systems. So it's got, um, you know, every piece that you would need kind of soup to nuts. It's not exactly good, um, but you can definitely check this out and, and it's got, um, you know, a couple of really basic modular decisions that go into it that can be reused. Uh, textiles is a tool that I made. So again, that idea of like tooling as part of a design system. Something I've found myself doing a lot for clients since I went independent is generating uh, textile libraries. So the annoyance here, I think like none of the design tools have solved this very well. Um, in terms of like being able to think about and communicate about typography with the design tool in a way that really aligns with like how a web developer would think about it. 
Um, so I built this tool as kind of a way to bridge that gap. So if a, if a engineer I'm working with needs to create more type styles, they can do that confidently because this is kind of, it's essentially storing like the underpinning ideas of how we developed the type styles in the first place. So you'll, you see it's got like a base size and a ratio. So we're creating a modular type scale. And then if there's like a particular style that's missing, like we realize we did everything for our type scale for one font weight, we need to add another font weight, or we need to add uh, a version that has underlines. Um, anyone can go in and it saves all this information in the design file. So then it can just grow the system um, without one person having to go and do a bunch of manual work, which is pretty nice. Um, another one I made, again, in the interest of cross-disciplinary collaboration is called Color Copier. So I was working with a client recently, um, an online publication, and they preferred, their engineers preferred having color values in RGB. Um, I personally prefer hex because it's way easier to just copy and paste a hex code than it is to copy and paste like every RGB value. Um, so I got really frustrated and annoyed with having to go and like translate stuff from hex to RGB instead of being able to just copy and paste it. So I made this Figma plugin that lets you configure um, what color values, uh, what color spaces you want to copy. And then you can just copy um, any or all of them out of uh, something that you're selecting and just drop them into a uh, document wherever. Um, so this was a big workflow saver. And again, because it saves a lot of this information to the actual design system file, um, anyone who picks this up will kind of by default be thinking about color in a way that aligns with uh, how the team has been working with it in the past. So that's our kind of high level on what, uh, what is a design system, what goes into a design system, what can go into a design system. And I think the next piece of this is then why would you want to make a design system or why would you want to use one? So why do you use a design system? Um, I think this is probably the more common question since a lot more of us are designing things with a system than are necessarily designing the design system itself. Um, so I think one big thing is that sharing uh, between disciplines makes collaboration that much easier. So if you've ever, you know, been designing a website and handed it off to your developer and they come back and say, you know, this can't be done, that's obviously a big frustration. Um, but when some of the kind of baseline decisions are made uh, with that collaboration in mind from the start, you can really avoid a lot of it. So, you know, even though you might at first feel like your creativity is being, you know, kind of boxed into like, I have to use this system. Um, it actually can give you a lot more um, flexibility to kind of like move past small problems and focus on bigger ones. Um, I think in a similar vein to that is that systems provide us with a baseline of consistency. So no one really wants to, you know, spend their whole day pouring over some big thing that they just designed and then making sure that like, every hex code matches and that you're using the same you know fonts everywhere and so on and so forth um, we really want to focus on like the bigger picture you know the, the big meaty problems that are exciting to solve um, so design systems can get a lot of the simple decisions out of the way and solve a lot of those simple challenges of just creating that baseline consistency so that we can you know move fast and um, I kind of move fast without breaking things is, is the next idea I've got there. Um, which is like, again, to just give us the ability to uh, iterate really quickly and react to, you know, our own feedback and our users feedback. Um, but by having some of these decisions kind of separated out into their own system, um, we can do that without worrying about uh, like necessarily big problems creeping up. And finally, because digital is just really freaking hard, um, which I'm gonna expand on. So for example, um, if we look at like international standard paper sizes, we've probably all seen this. This is, you know, like A0, A1, A2, A3, A4. We only have a few of these that we ever need to worry about. 
And when someone says A0, you know exactly what A0 is. And if you don't, you look it up and you know, that's, if that's the size you're designing for, that's the size you're designing for. Every person who sees that is gonna see it the same size and it's very discreet and it's, it's very specific. But if we get into something, when we start getting into screen sizes, um, this is kind of a recreation of a graphic I saw somewhere else of just, just Android screen sizes um, for their tablets and their smartphones. And there's a ton here already. When we factor in like, then Apple has its own sizes and there are all these other device manufacturers that have their sizes. When we get onto desktop, now you've got the ability for a user to like set their own window dimensions. And we have, you know, hundreds of millions of combinations that are super unpredictable. Um, this is kind of the reason why uh, this like inside out kind of like component first design system thinking becomes really valuable because we're never going to be able to design something digital that's going to, um, that we're gonna be able to say like, it's these, this size or these like couple of sizes and this is how it's gonna work. Um, it becomes really important for us to kind of break things down in a way where we can describe the individual pieces and how they fit together so that we can have that level of flexibility that's going to create better experiences across all of these different um, sizes. So digital is hard. Screen and window sizes are unpredictable and out of control. And um, as new hardware evolves exponentially, there's, that's only gonna get more complicated. Um, we're not designing for one or a few approaches and the approach we take for print just doesn't necessarily work for digital products. On top of all that stuff, just talking about kind of the viewports and the sizes that we have to think about. Um, we also know that in digital, we've got interactions and states and use cases and they're not always gonna be readily obvious. Um, so if you've ever you know, been in the situation where you've thought, I'm just gonna design one screen of this thing and then you get the feedback that, well, we also need an empty state. And then we also need a state where it's got a lot of information. We also have, we need a state where it's a different size or whatever. Um, it becomes almost untenable to actually design like every possible way that the thing is going to look. So systems give us a way to kind of design the rules um, and make something that's going to be like easy to predict how it's going to come out. Um, in different use cases in different states without being um, super specific, which is always gonna be um, just a super labor intensive process. Uh, another thing that I've just, I think is kind of unique to digital is that teams don't always use shared vocabulary. So I've been in the situation before and I have an example of this that I'm gonna touch on of just people calling the same thing by different names. Um, which just makes it really confusing and kind of slows, slows down collaboration in a way that's um, really difficult to deal with. Um, one of the big things that the design system I think can do is to just provide people who are working together and collaborating with the right name for different pieces of the thing that they're working on. Um, it seems like kind of almost a trivial uh, piece of the equation, but I think it's actually um, really valuable and it, it avoids a lot of confusion and it avoids a lot of like misplaced effort. Um, and I think another thing is I kind of think of digital products as like icebergs where like my experience of facebook.com is only 10% of it. Your experience might be a totally different 10% of it. Um, but really when we try, when you try to wrap your head around, you know, everything that goes into one digital product, the amount of it that you see or that you're aware of is really only a small piece of the greater whole. Um, so I think again, just having a design system in place is a really good way to kind of mitigate some of that and, and tackle some of that complexity and, and make things a little more predictable. So this is an example of um, what I was talking about with naming conventions being um, just a little bit different and the frustrations. This was a component I was working on and you know we could call it a modal you could call it a dialogue and the actually the head of the company insisted on calling it a dialogue shown modally um which i had to kind of awkwardly explain later it was like i get that you're trying to be a peacemaker but like there is a right answer to this and we have to um we have to align on it we don't get anywhere by saying like 
I, I hear that you want to call it this and I want to call it this. So I'm going to come up with a weird in between name. Um, I think it's important to take into account that it's really not about being right or wrong. The important thing is to agree on the name of each piece of the system. Um, again, I think this is just kind of table stakes. Like you have to um, give things the same name and align on that. Even if you're going to have to call something over and over again, a name that you wouldn't prefer, it's more important for that, again, that collaboration to happen um, for the system to be really clear about what things are called. So next up, how to make a design system. Um, again, this is going to be pretty high level um, and we'll get more next week into the actual uh, hands-on piece of this, but I'm going to share um, some experiences. So a simple four-step process doesn't exist for this. Unfortunately, um, every situation is different. Every client is different. You know, you might be starting a new product from scratch. You might be making big changes to an existing one. You might have a big team or a small team. It's always different. So I think the, the first step of creating a design system depends on too many factors to really say that there's like a process that you would use for everything. But what I can tell you is buy-in is super important. So getting your team all aligned on uh, the value proposition of using a design system. Um, it's a really important step. It can be really tempting to kind of skip it and just start getting to work. Obviously we're all designers, so we really wanna like get our hands on something and start. But I would just say, remember, get buy-in, figure it out. Um, if you skip it, you can end up sinking a lot of work into something that doesn't work out. Uh, no part, nothing exists in a vacuum. No part of your design system exists in a vacuum, which is kind of a, a weird realization that I've had that, you know, even though every part of it is modular, it's important to consider that it does exist in a larger context and to, to think about um, even the, the notion of like the design of, of some piece of it doesn't exist like only in design. It has to also be um, something that you can translate into production. I think another important thing to take into account is just that to make a design system, you don't need a big team. I think there's a, a misperception that design systems are only for, you know, big companies that have armies of engineers and tons of designers. And um, I'm going to share actually a case study of uh, a project I did that kind of goes, proves the opposite of that. Um, so this is Hartwood. Uh, this was about three months from when I started working on it until when we launched it. Um, I did all the design and I developed all the components for the initial system. Um, and this was created for a company I was working for called Spruce Labs, which is a, a tech startup that does technology solutions for brick and mortar retail. Um, and uh, so I created this whole thing with, um, started with Figma, um, and then built the components in Fractal and React Storybook, which are, if you're not familiar, they're um, kind of like sandbox development environments that enable you to kind of work on these um, components and make them, um, and then use them as a way to like collaborate and distribute them. Um, the process we took here, so there was an existing product already, um, but it was, the company was still very young. It was only about two years old when I started. So there was a lot of stuff that, you know, even though a, a product was technically in production, a lot of things were still kind of up in the air and up for grabs. Um, we started by defining our design principles, which again, just super important. Um, from there, we defined some shared color and type styles before even getting into components. Um, I think that can be kind of a daunt, like a difficult thing to go straight into um, to, to do those things kind of separate from each other. But again, like design principles gave us the foundation to tie everything back to and the confidence to uh, make sure that we could handle like different parts of the system uh, without necessarily having to do everything all at once. And then finally, um, I went and developed the components with plain HTML and CSS. That's what Fractal's for. And then React Storybook was where we took all of that stuff and then pulled it into a React specific context that enabled us to then launch the full system. 
So first, again, we had to get buy-in. Um, typically, what you hear a lot about getting buy-in for a design system looks something like this, where you've got a meeting with you know your head of engineering and your head of product and people from different verticals within the company and you have you know there's there's a lot of process that can go into this all that stuff is super valuable if you're able to handle it that way but honestly i think this is the situation that a lot more of us are dealing with um this is certainly the situation i was dealing with so it can feel like maybe you have to do things a certain way to get buy-in but i just want to share um, a tale from the front lines of an early stage startup. So when I joined the team at Spruce, um, the CEO of the company was actually spending like 20 hours a day writing code. So there was no way that we were going to be able to get everyone from leadership together for like a full day meeting to talk about design systems. Um, but I had seen that there was a lot of need for it. So instead of um, waiting for a meeting that was never going to happen, I went and uh, looked over a bunch of pitch decks that we'd been putting together and sending out to investors. And from that was able to kind of tease out what are the company values. So we use those to create our initial design principles. Um, so again, like I said, Spruce Labs is a brick and mortar retail focused company. So the, uh, the principles we came up with were heavily influenced by that. So humanity and physicality were really important. Um, when you tell people we're a, retail tech company they usually think e-commerce so we needed to make sure our design language was doing stuff to kind of counteract that um, typical kind of association the idea of augmentation came from like a lot of this kind of philosophical ideas that the founders of the company had which is that technology should exist to uh, help people not to replace them so like we don't want to create a product that's going to automate people's job people out of their jobs um, we want to create a product that's going to do things that people aren't good at so they can focus on what they are good at and what they enjoy. And then finally flexibility, because again, it was a really early stage company. So we made flexibility a core um, principle of how we were designing things. So everything had to be um, able to be kind of like reconfigured and, and flexible in that way. Um, bonus tip for starting out, I would say the first rule of design systems is don't talk about design systems. Um, sometimes when you just saying the word, can get people to kind of shy away. Um, there are a lot of things that you can call this. You can call it shared libraries or reusable components or like a design language or whatever. Um, either way, I think it's important to keep the focus on what are the problems that you're actually trying to solve um, and not worry too much about like calling it a design system. I think at the end of the day, we're, we're, trying, to, um, we're trying to solve problems and the proof is in the pudding. So this was another kind of early exercise that we did with Heartwood um, to outline the architecture of the system. Um, this is different for, for every design system really. And what you see here is really an example of us having a pretty green field to start with because there wasn't a lot of established um, DevOps to the product. Even though there was an established product, we were able to really do um, a lot with determining how we were gonna architect the system. So we start with company values and we pull it into Heartwood itself where we have design principles, um, shared styles, feature designs, components, and visual identity. All this stuff is just tied together and shown as like where we would draw kind of boundaries around it. What are we calling things? We made a lot of um, decisions about taxonomy here. So how we would break up different types of shared styles and what we would focus on. Um, there's also what you don't see here is a lot of decisions we made about things that wouldn't be included in the design system. So for example, like email templates weren't part of this, um, really even like page templates weren't part of it. There are a lot of, there was a lot of like yes, no work that went into this. And then we also did a round of figuring out um, the front end architecture. So again, using Fractal as our starting point for vanilla components, generating a style sheet, pulling it into React, all this stuff. And if this is, you know, if you're, if you're not interested in the engineering side, um, just know that I didn't come up with this. I actually stole this whole uh, front end idea from um, IBM and their carbon design system. Um, it's open source and you can kind of see how they're doing things. Um, and I just kind of like took that ball and ran with it. So even if you're, um, even if you're not 
savvy on the on the development side of things you can kind of like ask around and figure out how other companies are doing this and just by being able to show this level of thought to an engineering team can really help again with getting that buy-in and showing that you know we are thinking about this as a collaborative effort and not just a design effort um, so another decision we had to make early on was how we were going to call colors so like we want to make sure we're not going to have too many so we develop the grayscale but then we have this problem of like what color do we make the text or what color do we use for backgrounds or strokes or whatever if we don't make these decisions as designers our developers are going to make them and then we're going to lose some of that intentionality so we pulled um, from these more semantic color names and the great thing about this is it even enables us to do like modes and theming and stuff and to still keep the color names really predictable um, the takeaway of that was semantic naming of these things as a way to influence behavior and it makes it so that the easy choice to make is also the right choice um, so i would recommend considering that when you're thinking about like how you're naming things in a system um, we also made a whole library of design tokens which are those really simple um, stylistic decisions and assets. We put these on um, kind of like as a subsystem even um, that gets pulled into the rest of, of the design system. So we have like our colors and sizing and spacing and stuff. <clears throat> and then we're able to pull that in um, and share it. This is an example of how we would document um, a component and I think it gets at the importance of that modularity. So being able to put like a level of thoughtfulness um, into like every state and interaction um, and composition um, variations that we have here, like sizes and widths and that kind of thing. Again, just making sure that everyone who, who designs something to be part of the same product is kind of um, staying within the same parameters. And then we have like more complex components. So we ended up doing um, a card based system for the interface, developing like a lot of different use cases for cards and then using that to figure out what parts of it we would actually componentize. Um, and then this is just React Storybook, looking at actually getting the components into code and making sure that we're collaborating with our developers on it. So the results of this approach that we took uh, was that the leadership felt like we had basically read their minds and they totally bought in um, without us having to do, you know, necessarily like a meeting and putting sticky notes on the wall. Um, the engineering team had a clear picture of how we would be able to execute and how we'd be able to implement and how the system was gonna make their lives easier. So they were also bought into it. Um, and also because I did this initial work was kind of like an, a grassroots, like under the radar effort. Um, it kind of proved that a design system wasn't the same level of overhead as people had kind of assumed that it was previously, that it was actually something that we could handle um, kind of bit by bit. So I think it's, it's, again, that kind of like don't talk about design systems because it can scare people away. But when you prove that it's, um, it's actually faster to slow down and, and put focus in the right place, it can be a powerful um, piece of proof. So the lessons we learned, buy-in doesn't require post-it notes. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all process. All of this stuff worked at Spruce and it worked for Hartwood and it, it wouldn't necessarily work elsewhere. Um, if you have an existing product, for example, or if you have a bigger team, you might have to do a different approach. Um, another thing was really learning that a design system is a product in itself. So even though it is you know, something that we use as a tool to design products, considering the thing itself as a product was really important to make sure that it was um, able to actually be useful to the team. And finally, team size doesn't matter. We were able to do this with a really small team um, in a relatively quick time frame. I think though my biggest takeaway that I would give you for design systems, because they're so trendy right now, I think there's a tendency to feel like we need a design system because so-and-so has a design system. Um, and I think it's important to just always tie it back to what the actual problems are that we're trying to solve because design systems really should work for us. Um, but frankly, it can end up the other way around. So if you're not careful, you can end up um, spinning your wheels on stuff or doing a bunch of extra work and, you know, just 
never lose sight of the problems you're trying to solve because um, design systems are a, a design solution just like anything else. Um, so that's it. It looks like we did get some questions in the Q&A, so we can just start going through those. I think we have like 10 minutes left. Um, okay, so Linda asked, to what extent does the lang language the software is being developed in affect your choices in the design system? For example, when I was developing a design system in Angular, it was extremely arduous to get developers to adopt even common material design patterns. Um, I don't really, I haven't found that the language the software is being developed in affects the design system. Um, I mean, I would certainly hope that it doesn't, but it, it depends on like how your team wants to work together. Um, like we, we did stuff in Heartwood where we knew like the software was ultimately going to be written in React. I wouldn't say that really influenced, um, necessarily how, how we, uh, how we made choices in the design system. I think the only, the only part where I would say maybe that like that library or framework you're using should influence it is when it comes to like how you name things or how you label things. Um, if that can align with the way that people talk about that framework, that can actually be really useful because again, you're, you're kind of meeting your developers halfway. Um, yeah, and definitely, I mean, I think some of the problems you might have seen in adoption, um, I'd obviously be guessing here, but maybe it might be a, a case where you'd want to um, kind of invite your developers into the decision making process a little bit more and make sure that they're getting bought in and feeling like their voices are heard. Um, Cause it might not really be the, the language um, that they're building it in. That's the problem, but maybe that they're, they're feeling like disenfranchised. So it's important always to, to do that kind of advocacy work as well. All right. So Someone else asked, what are the fundamental differences between a design system and a style guide? I think that those are, they're almost interchangeable. Personally, I think a design system is kind of bigger. I would say a style guide is almost a subset of a design system where a style guide is gonna tell you like, the logo should always be this minimum size um, or like, these are the colors that we use. I think a design system is bigger than that. And, it should provide more context in terms of like, not just what's the right answer, but why is it the right answer? Um, okay, whose responsibility is creating the design system? UXer, UI designer, product designer, is it niche? I've never heard of a position for design system designer. Um, so I can tell you my, my uh, t like title at Dropbox actually is design system designer. Um, that, maybe isn't the most common title around, but it's sort of starting to become a thing. I think uh, it's not, I would say though really it's not necessarily accurate to say that there's like one position that typically is responsible for creating a design system, again, because that cross-disciplinary collaboration is so important. Um, I think it's wh whoever is kind of steering it ideally has both an understanding of design and an understanding of production. Um, again, because I think it, it comes down to like tying design and production together to, to such a large extent. Okay, this question can be saved for later, but I'm wondering why you chose to use Figma. I know Figma is very popular right now, but wondering what about Figma you found to be better than Adobe XD or Sketch? Absolutely, we'll be answering that in next week's uh, workshop to a much larger extent, but I can say right now um, what won me over about Figma is the fact that it is, um, it is, uh, it's been web-based from day one, and they've put a lot of focus on collaboration. Um, they are also, compared to other companies that make software for designers, they're a lot more community focused and a lot more responsive to uh, what their users are asking for. So um, I think that's, those are kind of the, the big reasons, but I'll, I'll get into a little more depth on that next week. 
Okay, so someone asked, is there a front end framework that you like to use or recommend to publish a system outside of Figma or Sketch? Yes, I really like to use Gatsby, which is a React based static site generator. Um, it's super flexible and it's probably my preference is partly explained by the fact that most of the teams I've worked with um, prefer to use React. So it enables us again to kind of speak the same language and also to, to say like, if I need help um, from a developer to get something out the door that's purely for the system, um, I can ask them and I know they're not gonna get hung up on it being like slightly different. So, I mean, there are a lot of options, but um, Gatsby is the one that I've found that I go back to the most often. Okay, and then could you please share the Polaris article with the follow-up email? Absolutely, I will make a note of it. Uh, how would you emphasize the importance of design systems and how they enhance digital products to reluctant leadership who have reservations about devoting resources towards creating one? Um, my own experience, again, I would just say, if you can, then just go rogue and make it happen. They'll see the results and they'll buy in. Um, it's, it's really hard, I think, to talk someone through the benefits of a design system, even though I realize that's what I kind of just tried to do. Um, it's, it's really a show don't tell situation if you can, if you can get away with it. Um, and really a lot of companies I've heard from have, um, that actually turns out to be kind of the origin story of their design systems is that they were really grassroots efforts where you know, someone figured it out and put something out that was maybe really small or really rough, but it was enough uh, to get then that cross-disciplinary buy-in and you know, leadership will react to that when they see that you know, developers are getting more done more quickly and designers are being more efficient. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I, don't, I think there's other resources you might be able to find online of people's experiences where they've you know, used metrics a little bit more to quantify the impact of a design system. Personally, I haven't ever really had to do that. Um, yeah, I think getting it, getting it uh, out the door and, and proving it is usually the best way. Okay. Um, is it necessary for a system designer to know about coding, HTML and CSS? It is not necessary for a system designer to know uh, how to write code, I would say. It is important definitely to ask questions about code. Um, if you don't have the ability to write code, I think it's really valuable to put things in front of a developer and get their input on it and ask them questions about it. Um, so you don't, you don't necessarily have to have the ability, but it's important to, to be thinking about bridging that gap. Uh, and is this presentation provided in Figma? It is. Um, so I will send out a link in the email um, afterwards. Is there a time when you wouldn't recommend creating a design system? Uh, yes, I think it, if it's, it's hard to really gate, like I don't, I don't have like a, a rubric for it. It's kind of a, you know, situation by situation basis. Sometimes a design system is going to be unnecessary overhead, to be honest. So um, you can always figure like, if you have a really tight timeline, for example, to get some specific product or feature out the door, you might just skip creating a design system for them and know that you can always go back and create the system later. Uh, you mentioned doing work under the radar, proved that a design system was an unnecessary overhead, but how does that play into actually getting the time dedicated to developing one within an organization? There are always other products, so how do you make the design system a priority? Um, I think we only have one minute left, and I'm afraid I'm probably not going to be able to do a sufficient answer to that question because it is a really good question, and it is a really big question. Um, I think that it's... Yeah, it, if you can prove that like an hour spent on the design system is gonna save 10 hours elsewhere, um, that's always a pretty powerful way to do it. Um, another way is to, you know, if it's working for your team and making at the end of the day, the team more efficient to get their jobs done, 
um, it again doesn't it's almost like you don't really need to get permission to make it a priority. Um, it sort of can just become part of the workflow in a way that's, um, that's going to be beneficial, I think. But again, it, it depends on a lot of factors. So um, I think we're just about at time. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Amy, if there's any wrap up. Thanks again. Um, for all the questions, I wish I had time to answer all of them. And I hope that you guys will join us next week and we can um, get into Figma and get our hands dirty. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was really fascinating as a, um, you know, I grew up as a print designer and have been, you know, doing interactive work for, since interactive work started. And I learned a lot, um, you know, about, uh, how I can use a design system to really create collaboration and um, and think things through in a way that's going to be more efficient for the building process. So it was really, really good. So thank you so much. Looking forward to next week. Um, so again, next week, same time, same place. If you go to AIGA or colorado.aiga.org, you can sign up for next week's session on Figma. And I think that's it for now. Um, looking forward to when we can be back together soon in our uh, location at CMCI Studio. Um, but for now, we'll have to, you know, live here online. So everyone have a great weekend and take care. And if you didn't get your question answered today, bring it next week. Okay. Have a great weekend, everybody.